the knowledge is tested in the part one of the uh, FRCS trauma and orthopedic, but that doesn't mean that uh, you are, uh, well, you are exempt from uh, being asked about your knowledge in part two. Without knowledge, you can't pass any of the parts. Then they are asking about how would you approach to answer the question? So don't just start answering the question by the answer you know. Listen to the question. Prepare it in your mind. Some of, during my practice, I rehearsed answering the question before just speaking loudly, okay? And with time, you are very good at answering the question as uh, quick as possible. Then they are asking whether or not you are a safe consultant. That's the main point. They are not asking, they are not testing you to be a brachial plexus specialist. They are asking whether or not you are a safe consultant. So that's the ISCP, the latest one, which basically for the neurophysiology and the brachial plexus disorders, not the highest level, it's the level three, but for the examination, it's the level four. So be prepared to be asked in the viva and in the clinicals about the brachial plexus. With the new format, there is no patience in it, but you have to know all the movements and all the tests. You have to know how to vocalize the tests now and how to vocalize and what is the significance of each test. So it's a bit different and easier and, and difficult in another way. Reconstructive surgery, just know about it, okay? You will not be asked in details of how would you reconstruct, um, do a reconstructive surgery for a brachial plexus injury. Then, what is the basic science behind the brachial plexus? It is a nervous plexus formed of the anterior primary rami of the lower four cervical nerves and the first thoracic nerve. So the root value of the brachial plexus is C5 to T1, and it emerges between the scalenus anterior and the scalenus medius. It is, gives afferent and efferent nerves to the, up, uh, uh, to the upper limb. I struggle to remember the first part of the brachial plexus, how is it formed? So the mnemonics of rugby teams drink cold beer, roots, trunks, divisions, cords, branches. That's give me the sequence of the names of the nerves that forms the brachial plexus. Then one of the main questions that can come if in the basic science asked, it is, how to draw the brachial plexus. So you are being asked and you need to draw this. Wow, that's a lot of things to draw and a lot of names to remember. So I made a small video to show people how I, uh, I drew it and how, how I in just 30 seconds, one minute by most, you can draw the brachial plexus and then start discussing the uh, outcomes. Two, we start with the root values of C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. With the mnemonics of rugby team, drinks called beer, so it is roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. We draw the three long lines like this and we say that the roots of c5 and 6 form the upper trunk c7 forms the middle trunk c8 and t1 forms the lower trunk then there is connection between the trunks at the divisions part then for the cords there is the lateral cord posterior cord and the medial cord the lateral cord, the main branch of it is the musculocutaneous nerve and a branch to form the median nerve. There is also the lateral pectoral nerve. For the medial cord, there is the ulnar nerve, which is the main branch of the medial cord. 
there is also a branch for the median nerve. That's how the median nerve is formed. And there is the medial pectoral nerve, medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, and medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. The posterior cord, you have the radial nerve, axillary nerve, upper, lower, subscapular nerve, and the thoracodorsal nerve. From the root value of C5, you have the dorsal scapular nerve, and C5, 6, and 7 together gives the long thoracic nerve to serratus anterior. From the upper trunk, you have the suprascapular nerve. Thank you. To be able to draw the regular... Okay, so back to, uh, back to me. So basically, there is uh, the Narcus root rule of 70s. So before that, okay, that's how we draw the brachial plexus in the uh, in the basic signs and uh, table in i drew it i drew it basically in two minutes if you uh, if you just uh, uh, view this video just before the viva by the night that's it you don't want to you don't need to uh, do anything you can just practice it in five minutes and do it in one minute in the exam if needed. So, Narcus Rule 70s, basically it's not asked, but it is a good thing if you know it, as this will give the examiner um, a, an impression that you know about this. You know that 70% of the brachial plexus is due to, that's the other one, is due to the uh, road traffic accidents, 70% of them is motorcycle and 70% is a polytrauma patient. So every patient with a brachial plexus, if you get it in the trauma or get it in anywhere, you will start by saying ATLS and go through your, your basic bits about a polytrauma patient. 70% is a supraclavicular and 70% at least one root avulsion. We'll go through this a bit more in details as we go. So, what is the mechanism of injury? It can be road traffic accident, it can be obstetric, it can be a shoulder injury like a shoulder dislocation, but this is usually to a peripheral nerve or basically a lower brach a, a distal brachial plexus injury. A shotgun or uh, iatrogenic, usually during uh, cervical uh, lymph node uh, biopsy or or basically axillary uh, clearance in breast cancer, they can injure the brachial plexus. Let us see what 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 are the different modes of trauma. We're talking today about adult brachial plexus, but basically, if you have an up Duction traction that's an uh, 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 that's uh, so abduction of the arm with upward traction that means a lower brachial plexus, which means bad hand, good shoulder. So, you're when you are looking at the picture, the clinical photograph of a patient, you look at two groups of muscles, the shoulder group of muscle and the hand group of muscle. So if the shoulder is wasted, okay, that's you. That's the upper plexus injured. If the hand is wasted, that's unclothed, that's the lower brachial plexus injury. If both, that's a total brachial plexus. That's the easy way or the straightaway thinking of when you see the, um, uh, the picture, what would you say? Or what would you think? Of course, you'll not say it straight away because you need to show the systematic approach to the patient. But that's how you expect the case to go. So clinical objectives. What are your clinical objectives from that? First, you need to take history. What happened? 
Then you want to identify the lesion. Is it supraclavicular, infraclavicular, and which roots are affected? And then you have to know what is the lesion. Is it the root avulsion or a peripheral nerve? And that's the, we will go through this, but that's the most important thing because how will you consent the patient, how you will consult the patient depends about what type of lesion and where is the lesion. Then you have to know what are the functions lost, what are the functions preserved, and how can you help the patient. So that's the nerve injury, but that's the peripheral nerve injury. And you all know the peripheral nerve injury about the sedum and the Sunderland. I like more the birch and bony, but the it is about the degrees and the grades of the nerve injury, starting from just conduction block to degenerative block. That's how Birch and Boney classified them and classified that the uh, conduction block can be transient or prolonged. And the degenerative block can be anything from axonotomesis to neurotomesis, according to how much of the nerve is affected. Is it the, just the axon, just the endoneurium, just the peri or the epineurium? That's so much important. And the picture or the dia diagram shown here is so much important to memorize during the basic science. Then the history. What was the mood of trauma? What event and what is, was the position of the arm? And we know why now what was the position of the arm and what is the importance of the position of the arm. Then when does it happen? And we will know from the, uh, in the treatment bit, the, the, there is different strategies to tackle brachial plexus injury. And these tr strategies actually are dependent on the time, whether or not it's a chronic brachial plexus or acute brachial plexus, and whether or not you are going to explore it early or late, and whether or not there is any recovery or not. So you need to know when did that happen. Then you need to know any associated trauma. So basically, whether or not there is any, you know, cervical spine injury, there is any other injury, other fractures, vascular injury, you need to know the associated injuries. What investigations did the patient have so far? And what did the treatments that he had so far? And basically whether or not there was an early exploration or not. And lastly, the expectation of the patient. And the diaphragm and diagram on the right side shows four different injuries to spinal nerve. With A, it is just stretched. B, it is stretched and usually there is some sort of nerve injury, but we call it nerve injury in continuity. So the whole nerve, the nerve itself wasn't cut. C, it is a nerve injury, but the nerve injury is uh, Basically, this is not a root avulsion, and that's so much important to differentiate between a non-root avulsion injury, which is C, and the root avulsion injury, which is D, okay? Then, examination. So now we are talking about the clinical in the FRCS exam. For the examination, that's the only bit that you need to know in a higher level. That means that you need to know how would you examine the brachial plexus and what is the significance of the examination. The, the treatment is not as important. We, and we mentioned that in the ISCP part. First, you need to know whether or not there is any Horner syndrome. And the Horner syndrome is basically due to the affection of the sympathetic ganglia next to the T1 level. And this is indicative that 
we have a lower brachial plexus injury. And this lower brachial plexus injury is basically proximal, which means it is affecting the roots. So this is a bad sign. If you see a patient with a Horner syndrome, this is a bad sign. Horner syndrome, you know, oh, sorry for the misspelling, but it is meiosis, uh, ptosis, anhydrosis, and enophthalmus. For then you have to start to see whether or not you have the roots affected or not. So the roots are affected, the signs for the roots are the rhomboids and serratus anterior weakness. We'll go through that, but that means that there is the preganglionic root affection. On the chest x-ray, you will find the high diaphragm. That means the phrenic nerve is injured. And again, this is a root injury. The fracture of the transverse processes, again, it is an indicative of root affection. And scapulothoracic dissociation, that's a common one with brachial plexus RTA, and that is that should be investigated, and this is an emergency, and this has a high association with vascular injury as well. So for the examination, you stand, if it's a short case, you will stand from the back, assess the spinal accessory first, you're assessing the trapezius. This is not from the brachial plexus, but this is a very important donor nerve. And how would you examine it? You shrug the shoulders. Then you have the dorsal scapular nerve as the rhomboids. And you ask the patient to squeeze the shoulder blades together. The long thoracic nerve, that's the serratus anterior. And basically, every one of you know how to examine the serratus anterior by pushing the wall. Thoracodorsal nerve, latissimus dorsi, and I like the thing that I hold the patient's elbow and ask him to mimic as if he's climbing a ladder. So it is basically extension of the uh, uh, of the shoulder with internal rotation. It is a, that's the latissimus dorsi. Then it is then the axillary nerve, which is the deltoid. And there is three parts of the deltoid, anterior for flexion, middle for abduction, and posterior for extension. So again, so if we go through the exam, the, these pictures, so the first one is shrugging the shoulder for the trapezius muscle, a spinal accessory nerve, a donor nerve. The second is squeezing the shoulder blades together for the rhomboids or the uh, dorsal scapular nerve. Then the third, you can see the medial winging of the, uh, of the scapula, the medial winging because he has, uh, he has lost this rates anterior function. And basically the, uh, the angle of the scapula is pulled by the, uh, by the trapezius muscle medium. Then the third, that's how you examine the latissimus dorsi. Of course, you have to, for all of these, you have to do it against resistance. And the other hand, that's so much important, the other hand should be on the muscle bulk, okay, on the muscle belly to see whether or not it's firing. Then, and you will examine the lateral pectoral and the medial pectoral nerves. Well, in the books, it says that the lateral pectoral nerve supplies the clavicular head of the pectoralis major, and that's tested by touching the contralateral shoulder. The medial pectoral nerve is the sternal head of the pectoralis major and basically pressing against the waist and palpating the anterior axillary fold. I find that the pectoralis major is examined as a whole. Then you have to assess the rotator cuff. The, the rotator cuff has to be uh, tested, okay? So the suprascapular nerve, and this is abduction of the shoulder in the scapular plane with thumbs down, that means the jobs test. The subscapularis, 
uh, sorry, the suprascapular nerve, the infraspinatus muscle, which is external rotation in adduction. The patient has to tuck the elbows to his chest. Then the axillary nerve for the teres minor muscle, that's the home blower test. And the subscapularis with the belly press test. Again, this is the subscapularis, the liftoff test. And this is the infraspinatus, the abduction, that's the external rotation test. So the external rotation test in, should be done in adduction, not in abduction, all right, to test the infraspinatus power. And then you have the job test, which is the supraspinatus muscle. It's better to do them simultaneously bilaterally to uh, compare between both. Uh, another thing found that in the job test, please put your hand above the elbow, proximal to the elbow, not distal to the elbow, as you are first isolating the supraspinatus. Second, for the lever arm, okay, for the supraspinatus to work, the lever arm of the whole arm is very long. Then, you have to examine all the terminal branches. For the radial nerve, you have to examine the radial nerve proper and the posterior interosseous nerve. The radial nerve proper, you will examine the triceps, you will examine the brachioradialis, and you will examine the extensor corpi radialis longus. For the posterior interosseous nerve, you will examine the index and extension and the extensor corpi ulnaris. What is the terminal branch of the radial nerve, that, that means the last muscle that the posterior interosseous nerve innervates, it is the extensor indicius propius. So extension of the index can actually tell you that all the nerves from the roots to the index are intact, okay? That's going through the radial nerve and then the posterior interosseous nerve. Then for the ulnar nerve, which is the flexor carpi ulnaris and the flexor digitorum profundus of the, of the little and the ring fingers. And that's flexion of the DIPJs of these two fingers. Then the abductor digiti minimi, and I find, if you can see me, I find that asking the patient to push the two little fingers against each other and palpating the abductor digiti minimi is the easiest way to do it. Then the first dorsal interosseous is basically to push the two index fingers against each other and palpate the first dorsal interosseous muscle. And then the abductor polishes, everyone knows how to do the from and side, which is basically a card and held by both hands. The trick is basically the hand has to be flat, perpendicular to the card, and he shouldn't recruit the F, I mean, the flexor polishes longus of the index of the thumb. Another trick, uh, trick movement is that he uses the flexors of the long fingers. Then you have the median nerve, which is basically the flexor polishes longus and the pronator quadratus. Both are done by the anterior interosseous nerve, the flexor digitorum superficialis, by the uh, median nerve proper, and the abductor polishes previous by the median nerve proper after or post carpal uh, tunnel. Why did I start with the motor, not the sensory? Because in the brachial plexus, it is advised you start with the motor, not the sensory. Because the sensory, for example, if the patient can, can't feel his shoulder, it can be either C5 or the axillary nerve. But for the motor, it is distinct, uh, distinct nerve supply. So basically, I would start with the motor and then uh, and then do the sensory. Another thing for the sensation, 
the sensation can be actually crude because usually the are you testing for the roots or testing for the terminal branches or testing and is there any um, uh, is there any inter-territorial uh, uh, fields that are supplied by another question. That's why we start with the motor. Don't forget to, to tell the examiner that you would like to test the vascular, so, uh, the vascular status of the limb. Then you will go for the investigations. So for the investigations, first, you will get uh, a chest x-ray to see whether or not there is any um, there's any high diaphragm as we said and showed before then you will get a cervical spine x-ray or a ct scan to see whether or not the transverse processes are fractured that might mean that the, there is root avulsions and the chest x-ray there is another thing so one of the donors is the first intercostal nerve. If the first trip is, uh, is fractured, so that nerve might be injured. So you have lost a donor. Then for the shoulder, if it's a shoulder dislocation or fracture associated with the brachial plexus, you can do an MRI scan. That's the next, but in old times, they did CT myel myelography, just like the one in front of us here. The MRI scan, the, th the, the benefits of that is basically it's non-invasive. And you can see a pseudomeningocele and an empty root sleeve, and basically the cord shifted away from the midline. So if you can, can you see can, can you see this pseudomeningocele here? And basically the spinal cord has shifted to the other side. That's a definite root avulsion. Okay, next you will do neurophysiology. So neurophysiology here is basically to, perform, to be performed at two to three weeks after the injury. Earlier can give you a false reassuring thing. What type of nerve conduction study would you do? Well, yeah, you can do the basic nerve conduction study, okay, and see the motor and the, the EMG and the sensory. But the uh, sensory nerve action potential is an important one to differentiate whether or not you are dealing with a postganglionic injury or a preganglionic injury. And I will tell you why. If it's a post-ganglionic injury, the, the sensory nerve action potential is lost because it tests the sensation or the sensory nerve action potential from the receptors in the skin or the terminal receptors all the way just to the ganglion, to the dorsal root ganglion. So if they are absent, that means it is a post-ganglionic injury. If they are not absent, so that means there is a root avulsion, okay? So basically, the root avulsion can be diagnosed by just, you have no sensation, but the sensory nerve action potential is present. Then you can have an EMG, which is basically after four to six weeks, you will get fibrillation. That's due to that the muscle is hypersensitive. But at eight to 12 weeks, there is no motor uh, action potential. And that is, that is when you, well, that's done, okay? And that will affect our management. After the neurophysiology, you will think now about the algorithm of the, of the surgery. Who needs the surgery? When surgery should be done? And what type of surgery? That means what is the aim of your surgery? Who needs the surgery? First, if there is no hope of spontaneous recovery, 
okay? Just like root effulgence, okay? What will you do for him? There is no hope for recovery. So you have to do a surgery for this, uh, uh, for this patient. If there is no clinical or neurophysiological improvement. So he, he was improving and then at some point he stopped any improvement clinically and neurophysiologically. What will you do? You have to do for him a surgery. Third, so, and then you have to ask yourself, when would you do the surgery? If you suspect the root of origin, that's when you have a high diaphragm, fractured transverse processes, your MRI scan shows uh, empty root sleeves. Now we know when to diagnose the root of origin. That's when you do an early exploration because basically he can't, he, he doesn't have any hope of spontaneous recovery. Or usually for the exam, be a safe surgeon. You will say, I will send it to the specialized center, but usually they wait for at least three months for recovery before exploration not the early exploration, but that's in the case of there's no signs of root avulsion. Then what surgery would you do? What is your aim of the surgery? You can't basically, you can't bring everything back. Okay, we can't turn the clock uh, uh, backwards, but we can. And we hope that we have some elbow flexion, shoulder abduction, and then hand function. So that's in that order so you that's your aims and that's so much important to give to the examiner that you are aiming for these uh, surgical goals at the end how would you do that so first well if the nerve is in continuity everything is good and just some scarring around the nerve due to anything like a blast or, uh, um, or injury or laceration or anything, you just can do some neurolysis. And that's the nerve is con in continuity and there is no nerve injury, it's just some compression. That's rarely the case. If you have a cut nerve and it is, it can be repaired end to end, so you will repair it. If the nerve is cut and there is a crushed part in the middle, you have to excise the crushed part. But you will need to take another nerve and graft this nerve. And this is usually the donor is the, sh the sural nerve uh, from the leg. But there is some prerequisite for that. Your stumps, the proximal stump has to be healthy because this is the grow. It has to be attention free repair or neuro neurography. It has to have a good tissue bed with no infection and good vascularity and within a suitable time frame before your muscles are all fibrosed. Because when the muscles are fibrosed, whatever you do to the nerve will not move a fibrosed muscle. That's the main point. So usually it's before a year. Then neurotization. What is neurotization? Well, neurotization is a surgery that's done by a highly specialized and skillful surgeons basically to transfer a functioning fascicle or nerve branch to a de-innervated muscle. What are the principles of that? First, the donor nerve need, need to be as close as possible to the end plates. It has to be an expandable donor nerve. You don't you can't have a nerve that is basically of an important function and you will sacrifice that. It has to be a pure motor because the mixed nerves do not do well with neurotization. 
and you just need the motor out of it. The donor recipient size must match or at least close to each other. The donor function synergy with recipient function. That is to facilitate the rehabilitation and for the brain to, uh, to learn the new movement. Motor re-education improves function, which is basically about the patient. This is one of the patient's prerequisites. There are few examples. You don't know, need to know all of them, but just for example, you can take one of the ulnar nerve fascicles from the flexor corpi ulnaris to basically the, to move the biceps. Or you can take the median nerve from the flexor corpi radialis, again, for the brachialis muscle. And again, both of them for elbow flexion. That's the first function we need to restore. Then we can restore the shoulder function by basically the spinal accessory nerve. And the spinal accessory nerve to the suprascapular nerve or the, uh, or the axillary nerve. We can also use the intercostal nerve. And there was an, um, uh, you know, an interesting case uh, I saw uh, that a patient who has an, an intercostal nerve to the axillary nerve uh, neurotization, every time he takes a deep breath, his shoulder abducts. Then we have the radial nerve from the triceps to the axillary nerve, the deltoid, because basically the abduction of the shoulder is more important than the extension of the elbow. Then you have the salvage procedures. Usually when you can't do the nerve, any of the nerve, uh, uh, any of the nerve surgeries. And that's when you are late, usually after a year, chronic brachial plexus injury, and the muscles are basically dead. So what will you do? You can do arthrodesis of the shoulder of the rest of the thumb. You can do tendon transfers, like from the trapezius to the deltoid or an elbow. And this elbow surgery is uh, an interesting one actually in which you mobilize all the flexor and the pronator mass from the medial epicondyle and you put it proximally in the humerus. So you're creating a tenodesis effect that will actually aid in the elbow flexion. Then you can actually take a gracilis from the and restore the, but this is polarized uh, muscle graft. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Thank Thanks, you. Joe. That was great. Uh, um, thank you. You know, I, uh, and, and I like the fact that you said, you know, go for the um, motor function when you're doing your brachial plexus examination in the exam because you know, you want to find out what's working, what's not working, and then you can talk about tendon transfers for the future, which is where you're scoring your higher marks um, rather than focusing on the sensation, um, you know, which can be a little bit variable, you know, in these injuries. So that was great. Thank you very much. So I think we have a couple of questions. Um, yes. Hanin Swan. Just, gonna just mind if I, uh, Joe, this is really sure. great talk um really uh, precise and uh, very well done but there are a couple of things which i often find uh, my our candidates don't realize um and it's worth kind of pointing out the reason why patients get horner syndrome is because of a cht1 sympathetic injury so an yes. upper trunk motor uh, upper trunk uh, root of ulcer may not present with horner syndrome so yes. just because you don't see Horner syndrome, do not presume it is not a patient who hasn't got a brachial plexus or it's not a root avulsion. Yeah. The second reason is people misunderstand why we need to address root avulsions early rather than late. Um, 
so the most co the the reason why is not so much that there's no potential for healing joe as the way you phrased it it's more the option of healing is blocked off because yeah. of the formation of the pseudomeningocele or the dura covers the root avulsion and prevents yeah. the nerve the nerve regrowth is, out in the nerve peripheral nerve repair system. Yeah, it it is basically that the in the root of Ulgen, the dura covering is covers a small part of the root itself. So there is a sleeve of dura around the root. So if the injury is inside this sleeve, that means it is a root of Ulgen. And this is considered as a central nervous system injury, which doesn't have a potential for recovery. If it's outside this sleeve, that is a peripheral nerve injury, which is, means that there is a, a potential for recovery. That's the main point. Yeah, absolutely. It's, but the reason why it doesn't have this potential is because the dura actually overgrows that the proximal yes. part and prevents yes. any... Uh, and uh, it's soaked in CSF. It's soaked in water. Exactly. Okay? So exactly. Perfect. Yes. Uh, so you're, we're bringing it, Joe, we're bringing it back to basic science. Yes, yes. That's everything it. is basic science. Yeah. yeah, everything is basic science. That's why I try to put as much basic science as I can in this talk. Brilliant. Well done. It's a very good talk, Joe. Well done. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Joe, another uh, option is, 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 is sort of mine. So how you can like do examination for like a baby or a child with brachial plexus injury? So it's very yes, difficult is... like yeah, to, for this child to cooperate with, with, uh, with you for examinations. You have any, like, any clue for that? Well, the, 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 the brachial plexus injury in the children is a totally different story here. This is yeah. more or less, this, is, this talk is about adults. And okay. in the exam, it is more or less, it's an adult brachial plexus uh, injury question. In the, I, I once I have, uh, I've been asked in the Viva that what if are called to the maternity unit and uh, because they are concerned that the arm is not working, the yeah. child can't move his arm. Okay, that's the main point. It is pseudo, it is paralysis of the arm. OK, they don't attain the 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 actually the 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 waiter tip uh, position of the herbs palsy straight away. So basically you can't actually see that and you can't examine the, the child motor wise. But the most important things, if it come if it comes in the exam, is that you you will examine the, the child for other injuries. You will do an x-ray to exclude fractures of the humerus because it can be just a, a fracture of the uh, uh, of the humerus, not a brachial plexus injury. And you will follow up this child. If the biceps comes back by around the third month, and some some uh, 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 so, some papers say six months, okay, that's a good sign. So if the child can actually bend the elbow by three to six months, that's a very good sign that this child will progress and this child will improve, okay? And usually surgeries are not done uh, around before one year or two years, um, uh, at least. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, there's no more questions I couldn't see. Could you see any, any question, Chuan? Okay. Yeah, there was one in reference to, is there any lag period from injury and getting MRI to avoid false positive pseudomeningocele? Yes. Um, well, this is the basic work, you know, the, 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 the basic work. In the exam, you're not being asked about these details in managing. And you can't basically refer the patient to the specialist center without an MRI scan, sorry. Okay, but the patient will have a, a, an, a CT scan of the cervical spine, a chest X-ray and an MRI scan to see whether or not there is any uh, pseudomeningocele. Okay, and uh, there is other, uh, other clues in the MRI scan uh, other than the pseudomeningocele, like the transposition of the spinal cord, the empty root sleep, everything. 
okay? So it's not just a, an MRI scan um, to rely on. Right. So I'm, I'm a bit confused by the way the question is phrased, as in, are we worried that if we see a, no pseudomeningeal seal, or if we see a pseudomeningeal seal, we're not referring a patient? Um, I would suggest that all those other signs and the presence of a pseudomeningeal seal and our absence, it doesn't matter, I'd be referring to a brachial plexus surgeon. Yes, it, it, it is. I think the question is that whether or not we are uh, worried about a root avulsion, early uh, root avulsion, and whether or not an early MRI scan giving just edema of the roots will give us a, a false uh, pseudomeningocele, something like that. Okay, but maybe that was the question. But, but, maybe, but uh, from yeah. the exam point of view, patients got symptoms yeah. Proceed with an MRI scan, refer to a, to a surgeon. Let, that's outside the area of an expertise. Please, areas. yeah. Please make it simple. And basically, just in your memory, you don't have time for all these fine details. You just have to, uh, you know, enumerate investigations and send to the specialist center. And that's it. That's the options. Full stop. That's five minutes. Okay. Um, I have a question. I don't know why you guys are direct messaging questions. You can ask them for everyone. Um, but anyway, uh, in root avulsion, the sensations will be intact, correct? Is the question that's being asked. Okay. Uh, it, it is a bit, okay. It, it's a bit um, confusing. Okay. Let, let, me, let me share because of the snap thing. I think the sensory uh, neuron action potential was I tried to uh, make it as simple as possible, but if I, if I, uh, uh, which one is it? Yeah, here. Can you see? Can 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 you see that? Okay. So there is a preganglionic and the postganglionic injury. In the postganglionic injury and the preganglionic injury, both of them you will not have a, sen a sensation. Okay because both of them, the connection between this, the, the receptor, the sensory receptor on the skin and the spinal cord is interrupted. But the sensory nerve action potential looks into just the peripheral part. So just from the receptor to the dorsal ganglion, not to the spinal cord. So if you have a postganglionic injury, you will have an absent sensory nerve action potential. But if you have a preganglionic injury, you will have an absent sensation, of course, sensory nerve action potential looks into the part between the receptor and the dorsal root ganglion. Okay, so if you have a postganglionic injury, that will be affected. The sensory nerve action potential snap will be affected. But if you have a preganglionic injury, it will not be affected. But in both lesions, you will not have sensation. Okay? So sensation is lost. The snap, if it's present, that's a bad news. Okay? So, yeah, congratulations. Your sensory nerve action potential is present. That's a bad news. Okay, because that means a pre. Yeah. yeah. Does that make a little bit of sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, Joe. This is one more question that uh, yes. Nick B has asked, and he's now blacked out. So I don't know whether he's back in or not. Um, and I guess um, it's probably more of a. So I think we're addressing clinical stuff rather than an exam, but he's put, how does one examine the brachial plexus in the acute stage when you might have an associated clavicle or scapular fractures, which are very extremely painful? Well, sorry, but this is a polytrauma patient that the polytrauma guidelines apply to, the both guidelines apply to. You, you will go for the ATLS, you'll go for the everything, okay, and the brachial plexus is not an acute or an emergency, okay? That you have other emergencies like 
a scapular dissociation or something like that, uh, scapular thrust dissociation, that is an emergency, okay? But the brachial plexus injury, you will wait for that. All questions, so um, great. I will stop the recording and um, we'll move on to the vivas, I guess. And just before we stop the recording, just a reminder that we are, uh, we are providing a certification to everybody. Um, just need to contact us on the FRCS Mentor. This is why we have a login account uh, so that we can keep track of everyone. Certificates are provided by the uh, our CPD certified by the College of Surgeons Edinburgh. We also um, have our concise uh, orthopedics notebooks uh, uh, book. You can get that on any reputable uh, online bookstore, including Amazon and Apple. Um, it is we feel we are. Uh, it is very helpful for people who are preparing for the exam. Um, the proceeds of which help to maintain running the, uh, the expenses of the mentor group. Trust me, we're not making any profit on this. Um, it just allows us to do more work. And one of the other bits of work is we're running courses. Um, please go to the FRCS mentor site. The courses are still available, including some uh, observers uh, in the more recent ones and some participant uh, slots in the Viva courses. Uh, thank you guys. Yeah, so, um, yes, yeah, Swan, I think the next one is the 20th of February, that one. Um, I can't remember, Mark. I think 6th of March, something else in March, something in April. But, yeah, if you get on to our website at um, frcsmentor.co.uk, we've got our courses on there and also the ones we run with the ORUK, uh, which are available on their website as well. Thank you very much.